Hello and welcome to The Hated and the Dead with Tom Lehman. In this week's episode, I turn to Australia, and I'm looking at one of that country's most unpopular Prime Ministers of all time. Tony Abbott was Prime Minister of Australia from 2013 until 2015. Abbott is, in some ways, a man of contradictions. He's a devout Catholic, but is also a member of the centre-right Liberal Party. Going against a traditional supply of Catholic votes to Australia's centre-left Labour Party. That's Labour spelled without a U, unlike its British sister party. He was also a brilliant leader of the opposition, who hounded Australia's first female Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, incessantly, but found that his confrontational, blunt and often offensive personal style fell flat as Prime Minister. Abbott's brief premiership, which was ended when Abbott was spilt, or deposed, by fellow Liberal Malcolm Turnbull, represented part of what today's guest calls the Italy with Crocodiles period. Australia had six Prime Ministers in eight years, but all the while remained one of the best governed countries in the world. At a time when the UK is selecting its third Prime Minister in six years, and when four of the UK's last five Prime Ministers have each only managed three years in charge, the UK would do well to learn from the Australian experience, especially because Britain, unlike Australia, cannot claim stellar governance or administration at any level. As such, this episode is as much about the wider Italy with crocodiles period as it is about Abbott, and as much about our near future here in Britain as it is about Australia's recent past. My guest today is Helen Dale. Helen is the author of several novels, including the award-winning The Hand That Signed the Paper, and also worked as Chief of Staff and Legal Advisor to Australian Senator David Lionhelm at the time of Tony Abbott's Premiership. She has also written for The Telegraph and The Spectator, as well as daily newspaper The Australian. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce Tony Abbott. Good afternoon, Helen. How are you? Oh, hello, Tom. How are you? I'm well. We are discussing Tony Abbott today, Helen. He was the Prime Minister of Australia from 2013 to 2015. Um, His political career was quite a lot longer than that, as we're about to find out. Yes. Um, Australia as a political system has inherited quite a lot of aspects of the British system of government. It's a parliamentary system. It has two big parties, one in blue, one in red, but there are some quite important differences uh, between Britain and Australia's political system. What do you think, as an Australian, are the big differences that a British audience needs to be aware of in order to understand how Australian politics works? The largest, single largest thing that causes the biggest number of differences. So basically the the differences between the two countries flow from this, and that is the electoral system. Uh, The electoral system is unique. It is among the most complex and probably is the most complex in the developed world. Um, Australia also has almost uniquely politically literate people, and that is so high levels of engagement and high levels of political literacy, and that is because of compulsory voting. Voting has been compulsory in Australia since 1924, and whilst it's Westminster system with responsible government and all the things that you and parliamentary sovereignty that you associate with with parliament parliamentary systems it um has two houses it has an entrenched constitution the two houses are elected differently both using quite complex electoral systems the lower house like that in the uk is constituency based with single member electorates and they each have a single member and they are worked out with great care so that you finish up with what is called one vote, one value across the entire country. The Australian Electoral Commission is much better run than any equivalent elsewhere in the world. That's why in those corruption analyses, Australia always comes out with the cleanest election election system in the world. So it's very clean. Lower House uses a form of instant runoff, as the Americans call it, and as you call the alternative vote. Australians call it compulsory preferential, which means you have to number all the boxes 
all of them. You can't just say one and two and then let the vote. The expression in Australian politics is known as exhaust, to let the vote exhaust. You can't do that. And you are not allowed to put the two major parties last and with the same number. So you can't go a whole heap of minor parties, one, two, three, four, five, and then put Labour and the coalition six, six. You're not allowed to do that. There was a fellow who attempted to do that, recommend doing that because he disliked uh, the way the electoral system worked to event to exhaust in that way. And it's designed, it was designed by a woman who's a very clever mathematician, a woman called Catherine Spence. Um, and uh, a man called Albert Langer actually disagreed with this because he thought that he didn't like the way the major parties had to govern from the centre because of the compulsory voting. So he advocated and it became known as a Langer vote and he finished up going to jail for it. So this gives you an idea that Australians will quite jealously guard their electoral system. Now that's the lower house. The upper house uses a version of single transferable vote, which you'll be familiar with from Ireland. Once again, also designed by the same individual, Catherine Spence, based on the Hare Clark system, but with some fairly important modifications to the Hare Clark system, um, including a relatively high quota. So you need to get 14% of the vote in order to get a seat in the Senate. But that, of course, is not just number ones, it is preferences. So you have the preferential system again in the Senate, but you don't have to number all the boxes. There are often hundreds of boxes. You only have to number 12 of them. You used to be able to have used to have compulsory numbering of all the boxes and allow the parties to do it for you. That was actually changed by Malcolm Turnbull in an attempt to reduce the number of minor party senators. And it actually didn't work. It's, Australians are, are numerate. We are all taught how to deal with this electoral system when we're at school. And Australia is one of those countries that scores relatively well on the PISA scores for, for, for maths. Um, so it tends to be up with the Asian countries like Japan and Taiwan and the People's Republic of China. And so Australians are familiar with their electoral system. And if, if governments try to outsmart the people, the people then very rapidly start to outsmart the government. And the that's the Senate. That's the upper house. And then constitutionally, the, the, the entrenched constitution that Australia has, like the US, gives the two houses equal power. And because in certain respects, uh, the Senate is more democratically elected. That's one of the effects of, of single transferable vote. It's more representative, even though it's quite moderated. It does not look like the Knesset. It does not look like the Bundestag um, in Germany because of a lot more care went into its design. Basically, it's a better design system. And uh, the use of the quotas means you do actually have to be quite popular to be a senator. And also federalism means that each state gets 12 senators and the territories get two each. And the effect of that is that you get differences between the states um, can be expressed in the Senate. So South Australia has for many years traditionally produced senators who were opposed to gambling, no pokies, poker machines. And I used to know Nick Xenophon, who was elected on a no pokies platform and he came from South Australia. Um, Queensland is traditionally the most conservative of the states and has, for that reason, had the largest number of representatives from one nation. Uh, Victoria has a lively tradition of socialism going back over a hundred years, and that expresses itself now um, in the election of a relatively large number of Green senators. They usually get one more than everybody else. So the, the, the states differ uh, uh, the, in a federal system as well. What this means, when you have the two houses of equal power, you know, two houses both alike in dignity in fair Canberra, where we lay our scene, basically, is that the only constitutional crisis that Australia has had, which was in 1975, happened because the Senate rejected an appropriations bill, which, of course, you can't do in this country because of the reforms as a result of, you know, the two sets of Parliament Acts, which were designed principally so, so David Lloyd George could get the people's budget through. Yep. Australia does not have that mechanism. So what tends to happen now after that constitutional crisis, which which was very serious, the government was you know running out of money to pay the armed forces and the civil service, and which in Australia is called the public service, and things like that. So um, what you tend to get now is an undertaking from 
parties that they will not block supply. That is the expression that will not block the money supply. Although from time to time you do get the minor parties will deviate from this, particularly the Greens, they've suggested that they, they are willing to block supply at various times. But it, is, it has only happened once and it did nearly bring the, the country to a standstill in 1975. So um, that's a very, very brief summary. But to, na to nail it all down, it is complex. It is intensely mathematical. The population is extremely civically literate as a result of the combination of the compulsion, which is, go goes back to 1924, yeah. and the education system. And it, it's very and it's very hard to snow the Australian people. It's intensely represented. If this is a country that cares about democracy and majorities rather than liberty and rights. Right. Okay. I, I think the the federalism point I was sort of expecting to come up, I, I'm less familiar with the, the point about political literacy, but it's quite interesting. And I'd, I'd like to filter that into some questions I'm going to ask you later. If we turn to Abbott, Abbott was born in London in 1957, and he indeed studied at Oxford uh, later when he was a young man. But his family returned to live in Australia when he was still quite young. What sort of childhood was this? Was the Abbott family a wealthy family? Was this a was this a, an upbringing, easy upbringing? Would you say? No, no. Tony Abbott. This is where Tony Abbott is um, a, quite a distinctive political figure, and in certain respects. Did, did not finish up on the side of politics that you would expect for someone of his background to finish up on the coalition, the Liberal National Coalition. Um, his family was Catholic. Tony Abbott was Catholic himself. Um, and whilst he was very clever, scholarships all the way through school and, and went to like posh schools, he did so because he won scholar academic scholarships. He was clever. And he finished up going to Oxford because he was a Rhodes Scholar. Um, there, there are two big scholarships to, to Oxford from Australia, the, the Rhodes Scholarship and the Clarendon Scholarship. And almost without exception, someone from Australia who went to Oxford won one of these scholarships. I was a Clarendon Scholar. I went to Oxford. So this is very common and it's just based on your academic results. And Tony Abbott was a Rhodes Scholar. And so one of the things that Australia has inherited from the UK, but in a way that is probably worse than it, the situation in England and closer to the situation in Scotland without being as serious as the situation is in Northern Ireland, there hasn't ever been violence as a result of this, is quite serious sectarianism. And so what that meant, particularly up until about 1970, was that if you were Catholic, you tended to vote Labour and support the Labour Party. And the sort of traditional Catholic, Catholic ideas about subsidiarity and supporting the poor and the trade union movement fed into the Labour movement. And Tony Abbott's family, and he originally had that sort of background. He was so Catholic, he actually went to seminary mm. for a few years. But he, he for, for, to use the line, he couldn't keep the rule being the rule of St. Benedict, of course, and uh, he finished up with a girlfriend and having to leave and because he wanted to get married and have kids. So that meant that he could be a Catholic priest. It was sort of fairly basic right. stuff. And, uh, I mean, it didn't make, mean that he was a weird rotter or anything. There's lots of men wash out of the priesthood for this reason. For that reason. Um, yeah. So uh, initially he was, uh, Labour tried to, get hold of him because a very talented young Catholic man, they would expect reasonably that he would finish up in Labour. And uh, why he, he didn't finish up in Labour was that this was also the period where Labour started to, instead of just being a party about trade unionism and defending worker rights and worker wages and conditions, they started to uh, be pro-choice. Uh, they started to be uh, quite feminist. Labour governments did things like decriminalising uh, homosexuality, decriminalising prostitution de in a couple of states, decriminalising cannabis, um, allowing you to have a certain number of plants in your garden, like in South Australia. Uh, and Tony Abbott objected to that. He was on board with the trade union and worker rights part of it and making sure that people were paid good wages, but he wasn't on board with the social liberalism. And so what happened is that that drove him towards the coalition and he finished up being a coalition MP and he was the member for Warringah in, uh, in, the, in the Sydney beaches. 
he was also as a, a younger man one of the uh, leading organizers in the campaign Australians for a constitutional monarchy I think is sort of the pressure group that was dedicated to retaining the queen as the, the Australian head of state D- does he have yes, a strong is- emotional co- connection with Britain sorry I think there's a bit of a lag yeah um I think he does I mean, there is a, a, a strong tradition in Australia, and I fall into this as well, of people who were born elsewhere in the Commonwealth, often Britain, but not always. Sometimes it can be Canada or New Zealand, India or the West Indies. Um, and when we had the citizenship crisis, it was all people from Commonwealth countries. It was, you know, it was first it was a New Zealander and then it was a... Um, and then there was a Briton, and then there was an Indian, and then then there was a, a, a Canadian, and it was all people from the British Commonwealth who had the dual citizenships. But there was this strong tendency, a large class of people from Britain had the and, and from Australia had this emotional tie to the United Kingdom. And I mean, my own family had it. I'm a dual national. My parents were. Well, my father was born in Scotland. My father, my mother was born in the Republic of Ireland. What made Tony Abbott unusual is the Catholic tradition in Australia is significantly associated with republicanism, sure. the su- support for making Australia a republic. So it was quite unusual for someone like Tony Abbott to be a monarchist. So here we have this old religious tradition that has roots in, in the sectarianism again. I mean, it surprised me at the time when I found out that he was such a strong monarchist because he's Catholic, and I'm used to Catholics being being Republicans. I mean, not always, not 100 out of 100, but certainly quite commonly Republican, whereas people who were from, I mean, from my family, you know, like the, the Scottish Presbyterian tradition or from the um, Protestant ascendancy in Ireland, that they were all, they were all monarchists and, and, and very pro the Queen and, and sort of loyal and fly the flag, and you would see people they would fly the the Australian flag and the Union Jack at the same time together and often wave them together when the Queen came and things like that. In well in, in Diana's famous visit in the early eighties as well, right? I, I, if it, mm. Abbott if we look at his political career a bit more closely, he entered Parliament, he became a member of Parliament in nineteen ninety four, and in quite short order after that the Liberal Party, the Coalition Party, came to power under under John Howard. And Howard yes. was Prime Minister for, I think, 11 and a half years. It's as long as Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister in the UK and a lot yes. longer than any other Australian PM has managed since. Abbott was a minister for most of the Howard government in various different roles. Something that was said about Abbott's British contemporary as Prime Minister, David Cameron, was that his lack of ministerial experience prior to becoming Prime Minister of the UK was a real issue for him it, when he was in government. Do you think Abbott's ministerial experience under Howard prepared him well for uh, his premiership, ultimately? I don't think so, no, because he just had ca- certain character traits that that worked out in such a way that I, I'm not sure I buy this idea that you need cabinet experience to be a good prime minister, or certainly not in Australia because of the, the cultural traditions. Maybe here you do, but Australia is quite different. It's quite a different system. Abbott had a certain character traits that it made him very effective as leader of the opposition, like astonishingly effective. He just, I mean, in 2007, when, when John Howard's government was finally defeated, it ran out of legs, basically, when governments get tired and they're just finally defeated. Labour won in 2007 with Kevin Rudd. They won a landslide. It was like Tony Blair's landslide in 1997. You need to understand this. It was a real landslide. You know, the, the coalition should have been out of power for a decade. I mean, obviously, Australia has shorter terms, only three years, so it's not going to be as impressively long as you get, like, Thatcher or Blair being in power for years and years and years. But you're still going to get a long period of orderly, stable government for the other side. John Howard actually lost his own seat. He lost the seat to Ben Long in 2007 with the Rudd, the Rudd slide, they called it. Now, I was over here by this point. I was, I was actually at Oxford. And so I um, didn't see Kevin Rudd's campaign, but I knew him very well because I knew of him he, for a period. Um, he was actually my MP. Um, and uh, he was a very effective MP. He was very strongly liked in the seat. I knew him. I remember him coming to my door canvassing, uh, which you have to do in Australia. You have to really, really get 
shoe leather out not to get people to the polls but to get them to get a personal connection with you because then because of the compulsory voting that personal connection can really matter and so Ralph was a Queenslander and he was a, an outsider in Labour uh, Labour traditionally, even as it became a bit more radical and a bit more feminist and so on and so forth, still recruited the bulk of its cabinet or shadow cabinet through the trade union movement. And Rudd came from outside the trade union movement as an intellectual. And I mean, a real intellectual. The man speaks fluent Mandarin. Really, really, really clever. Um, and the other thing is he also, like Tony Abbott, had a, quite a difficult background. His parents were sharecroppers. Um, Queensland still has pockets, uh, not so much now, but certainly when he, Kevin Rudd was a young man, um, of really quite serious poverty. I mean, I, I grew up in country Queensland and I can remember really quite serious po poverty from, you know, when I was a little girl, I can remember that there were poor areas of Queensland that still had the night soil man to come around and clean everybody's outdoor loos out. Yeah, and the thing is, I'm not that old. So Kevin Rudd came from that very, very poor background, but he was also extremely clever. And his particular thing was foreign languages. And I think he finished up. He was one of the, he's like Boris Johnson, one of these polyglots. He finished up speaking about sex. But um, but the, the one he was famous for was Mandarin. You know, the Chinese couldn't put one over on him because of his linguistic skills. And anyway, he should have been prime minister for years. But it turned out, precisely because he didn't come from that traditional Labour background where the union people tend to be very good negotiators. You know, they've learned to sort of put themselves in the position of the, uh, put them in the, themselves in the other person's shoes and negotiate. And so Kevin Rudd didn't have that because he'd always been top, he'd always been clever. He'd spent decades of his life just being right all the time because of how smart he was. It meant that he was an absolutely useless prime minister and he was useless in the sense that he couldn't talk to his own party and then he couldn't talk to the country either. And what finished up happening, and this is where it gets very, very brutal, is that basically the, pe the person who was doing all the governance was the deputy prime minister, a woman called Julia Gillard. And the governance issues in the parliament in 2010 had become ridiculous. There was just a great backlog of legislation. Nothing was happening. Um, Kevin Rudd couldn't retain staff. There was all sorts of huge problems. And, and there's an expression in Australian English that goes like this, uh, Gillard spilt Rudd in 2010. And that's where it, it, it's like a palace coup. It's the parliamentary party, which for Labour in Australia is called the caucus and for the coalition is called the party room. Um, over here, we use for both Labour and for the Conservatives, we talk about the parliamentary party. Uh, doesn't involve the membership or didn't at that point for either party involve the membership at all. It only involves the MPs, which is why it is, can be so brutal and so swift. I mean, Rudd, Rudd had the prime ministership taken for him in less than 24 hours, and it was so swift and so brutal, it didn't even go to a vote. And anyway, Gillard thought um, that she had to go to an election because she hadn't been elected prime minister. And this is, a, a unfortunately, a problem of influence from the United States. In a parliamentary system, you should not be doing yes. this. Yeah. It's not a presidential system. Stop copying America. It's, it's, this is ridiculous. It's likewise it's the same problem that the Tories are having now and that Labour Absolutely. had with Gordon mm -hmm. Brown. I mean, it's stop copying America. This is silly. Uh, and anyway, Gillard went to an election, but the problem was Gillard's opponent was this Tony Abbott character. And in 2010, she limped home. But then in 2013, because she'd had three years of just this relentless monstering by Abbott, who was an incredible parliamentary performer, he just could cut people to pieces in the House of Representatives, which is the lower house, the equivalent of the Commons. And anyone, if you... Ian Dale actually came and covered some Australian politics and sat in both Question Time in both the um, the lower house in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. And the Senate is supposedly, I mean, I used to work for a senator, is supposedly more genteel. And at the time, Ian Dale said, oh, dear Lord, I mean, this is just like a bear pit. Even the, the, the more genteel house, the Senate is like a bear pit. Um, it, 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 the brutality of Australian parliaments is just, 
astonishing. You know, things that people think that Boris Johnson has done that were rude or so on and so forth. If you put an Australian politician in the House of Commons, they would just like tear everybody on both sides to pieces and and be impervious themselves. You know, this is the thing that the political system is brutal. And it, it's uh, a it's a real contact sport, right? I mean, you know, yes. If if we if we think about Abbott as an opposition leader, he obviously went through this 2010 election, which he lost narrowly to Julia Gillard's Labour yeah. Party. Um, you've mentioned him being a very effective speaker and debater. If we go to the next election mm. in 13, Labour had been in power for six years at this point. Was he a good campaigner? Was he as good a campaigner as he was a yes. speaker? And yes, debater? he was a very, very, very effective campaigner as well. He was a good, good parliamentary performer and a very effective campaigner. And that's what led to the coalition victory in 2013. And that was also when my senator that I, I later worked for, David Lionhelm, was elected. But he was a crossbencher um, and elected for a political party called the Liberal Democrats, but they're not the same as the Liberal Democrats here. Liberal Democrats in Australia are the same as the old Liberals. So before the Liberal SDP merger, proper Liberals, you know, so kind of um, classical not the sort of weird classical Liberals, not the kind of people who go around campaigning about, you know, being able to buy goldfish in little plastic bags and all the other sort of mad things that the Lib Dems have done. Um, the Gladstonian Liberals. Sure. And sure. so. Th- the, despite the, the similarity of the name, the politics are quite different. And uh, so Tony Abbott became Prime Minister in 2013, and his big problem as Prime Minister um, was that this very effective negative campaigning that he had done, and before that this very effective parliamentary performer uh, that he'd been, he then persisted with that. It was like he continued to govern, but from behaving like an opposition leader. And, of course, you can't do that. Once you are the government, you have to rise to the occasion. Um, you have to, you know, bring the country together. You know, and I know it's difficult for people. I mean, you see people who we've got this current campaign going on now with the Conservatives and you've got Rishi Sunak and Liz Trust you know, tearing great lumps of fur out of each other. Um, and yet one of them is going to become Prime Minister, probably Truss, and she is then going to have to govern for the whole country. And this is actually very hard to do. You have to shift. Your character has to change. And Abbott couldn't make that shift. And he was just this relentlessly unpleasant person in the Parliament to deal with. And I was, by this point, I was working for Senator Lionhelm, and it was just... I mean, I remember my senator just saying, this is just a complete communication can, failure. He can't talk to any of us. He just can't get legislation through. It, it's just bad. Can you give, can you give a few examples of, of, uh, of this kind of unpleasant behaviour within Parliament? I want to get to some other behaviour of his outside Parliament, which you can probably guess the sort of thing I'm going to ask you about. But what was, he, what was the unpleasant behaviour inside Parliament? OK, what he would do is he would make undertakings to cross benches in order to get a vote out of them. Now, one of the votes that he got from my boss, and I remember he visited my, my senator's rooms in the parliament, Senator Lionhelm had a policy of trying to represent the interests of law-abiding firearms owners. And there was an Adler, a, a new kind of fire shotgun called an Adler shotgun. And unusually, it was a seven-shot shotgun rather than the traditional five shot which is very useful if you're trying to kill feral pests like foxes and and um feral cats and and so on and so forth and because of the historic tradition in in australia of having quite strict firearms laws david had to make lots of concessions and and say look i will i will give you my vote on this piece of legislation that you want to get through but please allow australian farmers to have access to this new type of shotgun which will be very good for getting rid of feral pests and tony abbott gave him the undertaking said yes if you vote for this piece of legislation i will ensure that the adler is allowed to come to australia and i was present when this conversation took place and so david loyally gave his vote and on and voted with the government in the Senate and allowed a piece of legislation. I think a piece of legislation that David didn't particularly like either. And then having got David's essential vote for this piece of legislation that he wanted, Tony Abbott, the Adler was banned anyway, regardless. 
he just went, no, nah, I've got my vote out of you and I'm now going to treat you with contempt. So what sort of that. stuff was he, <laughs> I'm sure you do, what, what sort of stuff was he actually trying to rally people around? Obviously you said that he was a very negative uh, leader when he was leader of the opposition. Uh, but as you've said or alluded to, part of being in government is actually trying to rally around things rather than against them. What was he actually trying to get done as liber- as a liberal coalition the prime minister? Thing that I dealt with constantly while I was Senator Lion Helms' legal advisor, the huge thing where he was trying to sort of produce this quality of national unity was counter-terrorism legislation. And yes, there has been the odd bit of Islamist terrorism in Australia. And yes, there has been the odd bit of crime with roots in the religion. It didn't manifest in the same way. It's, you, you see in Rotherham and all of these places, the, the Pakistani Muslim men and underage white girls in care. In Australia, it wasn't that. It was a series of uh, quite serious rapes in Western Sydney. But the thing is, because it's a federal system, this is not something that Tony Abbott could do anything about. The New South Wales government dealt with it. And to be fair, Australia, this is where Australia is different from the UK. There isn't this kindness towards ethnic minorities. People don't make excuses for them in the same way. And the gang, the the big, the gang of Muslim rapists, they were Lebanese Muslims, they were all just banged up for enormously long periods of time. The ringleaders were sent to jail for 55 years without parole. Yeah, extraordinarily harsh. You know, so basically the Australian government state government of New South Wales, laid down this marker and the problem has just greatly diminished since because this tends to be the Australian system's culture is very different from British culture. It's the, the expression that we use is that you cut down the tall poppy. If you get up above yourself, you will be cut down. Um, Sometimes even an expression is translated out of Japanese into into Australian English. The nail that sticks up gets hammered down flat. So it's much harder to make an argument about your specialness. Oh, my ancestors were persecuted or, um, or you know, Muslims are picked on or so on and so forth. It, this just doesn't fly in Australia. The only people who are allowed to make that argument in Australia are the Indigenous people, the Aborigines and the Torres Strait Islanders. If anybody else tries to make that sort of argument, they're just ignored and laughed at. It's considered, you know, turned into jokes, turned into the butter jokes. And so what Abbott was trying to do was rally the country around this, this rafts and rafts of really quite illiberal national security legislation. Some of it was extraordinary. There was, and they were, and badly drafted, but they'd been doing it on the fly. I remember a piece of legislation came through that was so shockingly drafted that, uh, you, it was relatively easy to interpret uh, a clause in it as allowing, um, ASIO, the security, which is the equivalent of like MI6, uh, the, the, the ability to torture people. And uh, you know, I wrote a speech for my boss and also a legal briefing and went to the Attorney General's department and the Attorney General's department had to admit with some annoyance that I was right. So, so this is the, the attempt to rally was all about national security, national security, at counter-terrorism, counter-terrorism, foreign fighters, foreign fighters, all of, all of that. Imagine what's happened over that, I can never remember her name, that lass who's gone away and finished up in Syria or... or Begum. Um, Begum, that's right. Um, but imagine that, but like dialed up to 10. And the thing is, Australians are quite patriotic. And anyway, they don't need this. And the, sure. the country doesn't have the sort of social problems that Britain has with where, where elements of the, of the Muslim community have just gone off the reservation and completely lost their mind. We haven't had 40 people blown up on, you know, at, at a rock concert or anything like this. That's not something that has happened to Australia because sure. of the way it's managed its immigration intake. Well, this is the other thing that I wanted to ask you about. With Abbott here, his, or certainly the coalition's, policy on immigration is often something that's touted by the right in British politics as being an effective, uh, demonstrable way to uh, control illegal immigration. Um, Did did Abbott do an awful lot on immigration? 
No, the credit for the, the very good immigration policy, and this is where I could sort of move segue on to the next point. Um, the man who stopped the boats, although you must remember there have not been, the immigration policy in Australia is bipartisan. Mandatory detention was introduced in 1990 by Paul Keating, a Labor Prime Minister. The chipping away at the Refugee Convention until it was eventually destroyed doesn't apply in Australia. The country's abrogated it. Not officially. It's not got up and said, we hate your international law, get stuffed. But it doesn't operate. Um, that process was started and greatly accelerated while Paul Keating was Prime Minister, was a Labor Prime Minister. Uh, basically, th because Australia has the largest proportion of its population born in foreign countries and of the most diverse sort. It's, you know, the, bar the peculiar historical exception of Israel, but you have to remember that it, the people in Israel are all Jews. The Australian settlement has been, we will do all this mass migration, but there are just sort of, the system is designed to force you into a cauldron, everybody. Um, and citizenship is this prize. It's done as a big ceremony, like in the United States. This is where it resembles the United States, but it, it's done very beautifully. An Australian citizenship ceremony is a very beautiful thing. It doesn't focus so heavily on flags and singing and whatnot like the Americans do. Uh, typically, they get a plant to take home one of the very distinctive um, native varieties of eucalyptus with very unusual flowers and that kind of thing. Um, but so the Australian settlement was very much based on we will do this system of mass migration, but we will do it in our own way and on our own terms. So it's important to remember that the immigration system that someone like Priti Patel wants to copy is bipartisan in Australia. It is not just one party mm. or the other. Started by Labor, but continued by the other side. What Abbott was doing was focused very narrowly on terrorism. And it didn't really have much bearing on what was happening in immigration anyway. There was, however, a period while Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister, and this was part of his general problems he had with governance. He didn't like the mandatory detention. He didn't like the offshore detention. He thought it was cruel. And he was coming out of that labour, that intellectual labour tradition where people can kind of safely be sorry for migrants because the, their main encounter, the main reason they have anything to do with with immigrants is, you know, a, a, an inexpensive nanny. They don't encounter job competition. They don't um, encounter workplace competition like other people do. And so his background outside of the trade union movement really showed. And there was basically a period while he was prime minister where the, not the caps weren't fully taken off, but it was, it became clear that Australia had become a lot softer and the boats started up again. And the Timor Sea is a lot more dangerous than the English Channel. And so they started drowning in large numbers, even when there was an attempt to you know, rescue them and that kind of thing, often that, that it was too late. And it got that way that the, and I actually know the individual who was involved in this, that the Labour Immigration Minister under Rudd, who was one of the ones who helped spill him so that Gillard could become Prime Minister, was lining up matches on his desk every time, and each match represented five asylum seekers who drowned in the Timor Sea. And he was lining them up on his desk and it was sending him around the twist. Basically, what happened when Abbott took over, his immigration minister was Scott Morrison, whose name should be familiar to you, and this is the segue. Scott Morrison stopped the boats or, or brought Australia back to what it had been when John Howard and Paul Keating were prime minister, the boats stopped. And it, it required some really quite draconian and authoritarian you know, and all those adverts that you see you will not make your home in Australia you cannot get citizenship if you come if you uh, if you're an asylum seeker in those circumstances you know so all of this legislation excising bits of the country out of what is known as the migration zone S Scott Morrison was the person who was behind that and he was very successful at it the boat stopped the drowning stopped and Australia just reverted to what it had been the, the narrow rally, attempt to rally that Abbott was doing was just about terrorism. It wasn't about immigration. Right. They're seen as very, very separate things in Australia. Given the picture that you've painted of Abbott as not being a particularly gracious prime minister to the people on his own side, it's perhaps not very surprising that he didn't last very long. Um, well, he, no, and I, I was actually in Canberra when he was rolled, spilt. Well, this is what I... This 
this is this is what I wanted to ask you next. Can you go into the events of September 2015? What was the sort of lead up to uh, this spill? Well, basically, you'd have this relentless, relentless negative government. And what had happened that there is a company in Australia called Newspol, which is a little bit like the, a, a combination of Servation and YouGov. And it's a big polling company. It has a lot, and it has an exceptionally good rec reputation. Partly because voting is compulsory in Australia, polling is easier because the uh, there are you know, three big unknowns for most in most democracies. Is is the and one of those big unknowns is is the person even going to vote once they Turn told up. you who they support turn out. Australia doesn't have to worry about it, it only has to care about you know, um, who you're going to vote for and is your sample representative, that's all they have to care about. They don't have to worry about turnout because it's compulsory and everybody votes and if you don't vote you get fined. And so what had happened is that Tony Abbott had lost 30 news polls in a row. It was becoming quite clear because there was going to be an election in 2016, it was becoming quite clear that he, if he went to the people, he would lose. He would lose government. And the coalition, like the Tories here, have sort of two broad streams in them. They have the classical liberals who are kind of like the old liberals here, the Gladstonian liberals. Um, who are economically really quite dry. That's the expression that's used in Australia. They're quite dry. They're the Liz Trust sort. But they're socially quite liberal. So pro-same-sex marriage and, um, you know, they, they won't do affirmative action or anything like that. You don't get that quality, but, you know, pro more women in the parliament and, uh, you know, pro decriminalisation of cannabis or medical marijuana. And th those kind of things, they're socially liberal. But the big issue yeah. in Australia, the big driving issue was same-sex marriage at the time. But the thing is, the other part of the coalition, and particularly people from the National Party, which overwhelmingly represents rural Australia, and also, interestingly, a large number of Aborigines, people forget this, they think the Aborigines because they're black and they're the Indigenous people, they all have to be on the, the Labour Party side. But as Politics doesn't work quite the same way. That They are a quite traditional community, and many of the ones in the country are quite conservative, socially conservative, because they're still quite traditional, semi-tribal people. And so what, this, what happened was that um, Malcolm Turnbull, who was this very, very capable, gifted lawyer and merchant banker, he's one of the, he's like Rishi Sunak, so in terms of fabulously personally wealthy, regularly was in the sort of top 100 people in, the, in, in Australia for personal wealth. Uh, very, very economically successful, both as a barrister and as a merchant banker. He was very good at both. And he spoke so beautifully. He was this beautiful public speaker, and he still is. I mean, he would get up in Parliament and just, like, you know, David Cameron wowing everybody at Conservative Conference without speaking, speaking without any notes? Well, because Turnbull had been a barrister for so long, he wasn't the kind of plodding barrister who depends on um, having really good written submissions, which is Keir Starmer's approach. Keir Starmer's had a reputation for excellent written submissions, and as we've all seen, he's quite a poor speaker. Uh, Turnbull could do both beautiful written submissions, but also the, the traditional old style, beautifully spoken barrister who didn't need notes and just had it all in his head. And so he just got fed up with all the, the constant losing of news polls, the relentless negative campaigning, the attempt to rally the Australian people around a form of patriotism that Australians really quite find quite offensive. You know, so basically Abbott was doing these public spe speeches in the parliament and people were starting to joke about how many flags there were behind it because the number of flags was increasing. And Australians have the same thing as in Britain here. Um, they're more patriotic, more of demonstrably patriotic than British people, but they are not like Americans. And flag shagging, of that sort is frowned upon in Australia. I remember when I was a little girl in Queensland, which was a conservative and quite patriotic state, there was a man in my street who had a flagpole with the Australian flag on it. 
uh, like Americans routinely do. And everybody in the street thought he was weird and wouldn't talk to him. OK, so this is not something you do in Australia. It's considered over, over demonstrative. And so Abbott was really pushing this and it just doesn't fly with Australians who are getting really pissed off. And it didn't fly with Malcolm Turnbull, uh, who was personally very popular with a lot of people because of his beautiful speaking and his and also like Abbott, another Rhodes Scholar, also very clever, but just had this public speaking ability that from being a barrister, Abbott wasn't a barrister. You know, it's just a different background. And so what Turnbull did is he worked the numbers. This is what you have to do in the party room. It's called the party room for the coalition, remember, caucus for Labour. So when uh, Rudd and Gillard were playing off against each other, um, you have, you're dealing with the fight in the caucus. With the coalition, it's in the party room. And remember, it went Rudd, Gillard, Rudd, because Rudd came back to try to save the furniture from Abbott in 2013. And he saved some of it. He kept some of his marginals. Uh, so, but it's the party room for the coalition. And so Turnbull worked the numbers in the party room and spilt Abbott. And I remember the spill. I was in my senator's rooms and all of the, 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 the rooms in Parliament House are equipped with televisions. We were in the corner of, and there were sort of three offices. My senator had one and I had one. And then the rest of the more junior staff was sh sort of shared two or three of them in another room. And one of the TV cameras was in my office and we were all standing in my office just watching it. My senator was there and Turnbull came out and gave one of these incredibly fluent, beautiful speeches that he did could do and you know i will take australia forward and he was sort of making the case for conservative economic policies because abbott because of that catholic tradition was more inclined to be a big spender turnbull was not a big spender he wanted to cut the budget cut 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 you know much more sort of a liz truss type figure so it's almost like a it's uh, almost austerity. like a it's almost like a a a comparison between the editorial pages of the ft versus the daily mail or something like that, or the Daily Express, right? FT versus the Tory graph, remember? You have to yeah. remember better educated, right. more politically literate population. So it's the FT sure. versus the Telegraph, basically. And so T Turnbull did this, and he was more simpatico with my senator. They were friends. I mean, Turnbull at various points would ring me up and say, oh, can I come around and chat to your senator? You know, chat to you. Because I had some, I'd been quite successful as a novelist. And at one point he came around to our office with copies of my novels and said, can I, can you sign them for me, please? You know, dear Prime Minister, you know, sign, my, sign the novels. This kind of thing. And he was always wonderfully smooth and courteous and so on and so forth. But underneath that, and this is where we go to the next thing and how does Scott Morrison become Prime Minister, despite his giftedness and his wonderful speaking ability, Turnbull had many of the same character flaws as Kevin Rudd. You know, he'd never, ever had people just say, no, you're wrong, and then argue him into the ground. You know, he'd always been so much cleverer and so much more able than all the people around him. He just expected deference. And so he wasn't good on when there was going to be arguments, both within his own party room, and this particularly emerged over same-sex marriage, and also with the crossbench once again. And I just remember David being so disappointed, my senator, after the first few months of Turnbull thinking, oh, it's going to be an improvement. This will get better now. We're not going to have these idiot coalition it people didn't. making me promises, taking my vote, and then chopping me off at the socks like the Adler story. And this happened with various things. But that's one I remember really well. And it didn't improve. You still had these terrible problems with negotiation. And the... And the one shining exception to that, who was very good at negotiating, who understood that he had to work with people who disagreed with him on a principled basis and who could talk to the cross the Senate crossbench, the people who weren't from either of the two big parties, and also talk to Labour, was Scott Morrison. Scott Morrison could do that. He had those skills. And that is why when Turnbull was eventually spilt, he was spilt by Morrison. Um, so if we, if we look at this sort of era of liberal government then. I, 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 actually, I'll ask you something else first. I want to crack this because th this is a podcast mostly about controversial politicians. And I think the thing that Abbott has become quite controversial for, not only in Australia, but particularly in uh, the rest of the Western world, is are these allegations of misogyny. Is Abbott a misogynist? 
No, I don't think he is. I just think he's very rude to everybody. I just think <laughs> he's rude to everyone. And I have to say, part of the problem for women in Australian political culture is the brutality of it means you have to toughen up. And I am not persuaded by all these various feminist attempts to be kind and to not say mean words and so on and so forth, because in the end they are just words. And I have, I actually went on Newsnight in 2017 because they wanted me to talk about Australian politics and I was finished up talking about, talking with some person from the Women's Equality Party who was trying to turn out everything, including the House of Commons, which is much politer than Australia, by the way, into sort of some cream teas. And that is not the way it works. Congress in the United States is beautifully polite. They are gorgeously polite, all of them. There are far fewer women there, but also Congress is toothless. The real power in the United States is the Supreme Court, as we have just seen with Roe and Wade. Whereas the reason debates are lively in the House of Commons and even livelier in the House of Representatives in Australia is because that is the field of real political contestation. And if you can't handle being called a nasty name or very, very robust disagreement, which to be fair is a problem that men can have, Kevin Rudd had it and so did Malcolm Turnbull, um, then public life is not for you. So this is mm. not a, an argument mm -hmm. I accept. What I do accept is that he, Abbott was relentlessly negative, relentlessly rude, and he would take people for granted, as he did to my own senator. My own senator was a man from the country, a country large animal veterinarian before he was elected. You know, so not a, you couldn't get anybody more rural and rustic and hardy than my senator. And he objected to having his vote taken for granted as much as any woman MP or senator would. It was just this persistent bad behaviour and rudeness. Well, this, this of course, led to the famous... Uh, misogyny speech from Julia Gillard in the House of Representatives in, I think, 2012. You take a fairly dim view of that speech? No, I don't take a dim view of the speech. It was an excellent piece of rhetoric, but you must remember it was not substance. spontaneous. It was drafted. Bef it was all. It was all drafted beforehand by her, her speechwriter. And I mean, I know how these systems work because I used to draft my my sentence speeches for him. <laughs> and. One of the things the allegate one of the things that was actually thrown at my senator when he hired me, if you hire an award winning writer, Paul Keating did so with another award winning writer back when, when he was Prime Minister, he hired a chap called Don Watson. And the the comments in the Australian press when David Lionhelm hired a Miles Franklin award winner was, Oh, you just want the nicest speeches because you get an award winning writer to write your speeches for you. And Julia Gillard had a very good speechwriter. I'm not going to say his name because he's not been disclosed, but uh, he, had a, he was a very good speechwriter and she delivered a very good speech. But this whole school of feminism that turns on mean words and don't call me that and so on and so forth, I have no time for. I think it is nonsense and I think women need to get over it. And the failure to get over it, this whole desire to control people's speech and language, has, and I'll just make a tiny well, little one sentence diversion here, come, has come back and bitten feminism in the bottom because now they're suddenly discovering that the trans activists who disagree with them are saying, oh, well, all right, you know, we're going to change the language again and make it to suit us. And, and feminists are being placed in the position of all the old golf club balls who didn't want to say chairperson, they preferred to say chairman. And you know, all of this is just nonsense in my view, complete and utter whiny nonsense, and I have no truck with it. Uh, from uh, if I can who just tries to play that game, if if I can just come in there, there's um, there's quite a famous video, for instance, of Abbott in a call in, a radio call in, where he uh, there's a, a an elderly woman that that calls into the radio station that Abbott's taking the calls, and she's a, a, a poor woman and she's resorting to uh, telephone sex work, I think, to pay her bills. And Abbott, I presume, doesn't think that he's on camera and he sort of winks over his uh, at his uh, advisor in this very laddish way. I mean, that's not just kind of, that's not whinging nonsense, really. It's, that's, that's, that's a pretty foul thing to do. Well, I mean, also he did with a, um, 
uh, a soldier's family and the man had just, I, I, I'm not familiar with the incident you described, but the incident that I'm most familiar with is a soldier's family man had just been killed in Iraq or Afghanistan or something like that. And Abbott's response was, I, I don't know whether I'm allowed to swear on here, but Abbott's Go response on. was, oh, what a shit thing to happen or, some, or, or something. Words yeah, to I've that seen effect. That yeah. And it was just totally tin-eared and landing your foot right in the poo. Uh, and he did this routinely. Absolutely. This is not what you say to the family of a man who's just been killed in action. You just don't. Um, likewise, the the, the, the behaviour on the radio station, if it's as you describe, this is the, the, he would do this repeatedly. You know, it was part of this general culture of negativity and rudeness, and fla and then behind the negativity and the rudeness was the constant flag shagging. You know, uh, which didn't exist as a word then. I'm using it now because it's a use useful term for British politics, and people on both sides do it. Mm. You periodically get the Tories with it, with it, but then you had all those ridiculous people's oh, vote marches yeah. with, with the painted faces of the blue stars, and I'm just sitting there and going, "My God, your British versions of Tony Abbott." That's what I thought. I remember sitting there <laughs> thinking, "Your British versions of Tony Abbott, and you're all completely embarrassing. Stop it." But that is what Abbott would do. He would just do it all the time. It was relentless. And he would be rude to people. Uh, he would be publicly rude to people or so, uh, and so on and so forth in this extraordinary way. And it just, it, it just made, it, it, it brought the office down, the office of prime minister, and it had its roots in this continued desire to try to govern from opposition, to, to behave as prime minister as he had when he was campaigning to to be elected. And you don't do that. You, that, that. That's not the way a parliamentary system works. You have to govern for the country once you're elected. I just have a couple more questions for you. It's about Australian politics more generally since Abbott left. If you look at the three prime ministers that the Liberals had in the 2013 to 22 era, Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison, is there one in particular that you think the Liberals look back on or will look back on now, now that they're out of power, and think, I wish we'd given him a little bit longer? Probably not, realistically. I think all three of them were seriously flawed. Um, even though Morrison was a good negotiator and an excellent immigration minister, he was also an example of the Peter principle. He, he kept getting promoted and promoted and pro promoted until he was finally promoted to a position uh, where he wasn't good enough. And that was the position of prime minister. Now, obviously, COVID, it's really awful. He got elected in 2019 and got and there's only three year terms in Australia and instantly lost two years of it. Gone. Got. You know, was not able to do any anything in the in what he'd taken to the people in 2019. So that's very unfortunate for Morrison. Perhaps Morrison might have shown in normal times that he'd have been a good prime minister. The, the, the same argument obtains, I think, with Boris Johnson. Perhaps in normal times, mm -hmm. Boris Johnson would have been an excellent prime minister, optimistic and take the country forward and govern from the centre and all that. But then COVID came along and it blew up all over him. This all, it also blew up all over Morrison, although less seriously because Australia responded to COVID far more effectively than pretty much anywhere. Um, but I do, honestly don't think the Libs are going to look back on any of those people with a great deal of fondness. They're going, fondness, they're going to sit there and Labor will as well because of the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd thing where you had six, if you count Rudd twice, you had six prime ministers in eight years, where Australia turned into Italy with crocodiles. It was ridiculous. I mean, it, it, was, it, it became so ridiculous that, I mean, you have this with the NHS as well, but we have it with paramedics. The Australian system is different, but it's a universal healthcare system. And one of the things a paramedic asks you if you've been concussed at a football game or something like that is they ask you who's the prime minister, you know, to see whether... <laughs> <laughs> whether you're going to have a proper yellow out for concussion. Paramedics in Australia could not ask that question because the country kept changing prime ministers so regularly that they had to come up with other questions. Like they had, in New South Wales and Queensland, they, they had to ask who won the later, latest state of origin, which is the rugby league between the two states. Um, in Victoria and South Australia and West Australia, they'd have to ask who won the flag, which is the Australian football, um, Australian rules football competition. They couldn't ask who was the Prime Minister anymore because we'd had six Prime Ministers in eight, in eight years. It was ridiculous. 
and I called it, you know, in a piece of journalism, I called it the country's turned into Italy with crocodiles. And yet, weirdly, underneath it all, you have this prosperous, orderly, well-governed yes. country that continued to run as, as it should. Meanwhile, all these people, you know, knife, knife, knife again, you know. Well, well, this is... Mad. This is what I wanted to ask you as a, as a final question, as sort of, sort of building through this sort of 15 year or so year period that we've been looking at. The UK is now about to choose its third prime minister in six years. So it's almost getting yes. into Australia territory. Yeah. Britain is not as well governed a country as Australia. I don't think. No, that's quite um, true. No, it's not. Do, 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 do you think that a country like the UK, which has a, a much, much poorer level of political education, economic prosperity, do you think that Britain can cope with the sort of destabilisation of the Conservative Party leadership that we're seeing? I, I, I don't know. I hope so. But it does worry me because the instability is in both sides of politics. I mean, Keir Starmer has not got control of Labour either from those all those maddies that were elected when Corp either elected into into the parliamentary party or are still in the membership. I mean, the Tories have got about two hundred thousand members. Labour, obviously, they'd got up to about four hundred and fifty thousand because of Corbyn, and a lot of those have left. But they still have many more members than the Tories. They still have something like three hundred thousand, a massive yep. amount of members, and many of those are the ones that joined as a result of Corbyn. So we've got like serious structural instability at the top of both the major parties in this country, meaning in the UK, because I live here now. And you don't have the governance underneath it that Australia has. Um, and to be fair to Australia, first Morrison served out his full term. OK, COVID, fine. He lost the election probably as a result of COVID. That's to be expected. Lots of people have lost elections as a result of COVID. But Albanese, the new Labour Prime Minister, has taken over and he is from that union tradition, the, the same sort of tradition that gave us Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. He's very competent. He's very steady. He's quite dull. He's not a flamboyant man, but he, he has re reverted back to that Australian t tradition, John Howard, Paul Keating, a very competent, stable, steady governance. So basically you've got the civil service, which is called public service in Australia, and the parliamentarians and the prime minister, regardless of party, lining up again in that sort of competent, steady, steady on the tiller kind of way. So Australia's gone back to what it was after that weird period of Italy with crocodiles, which I lived through a significant part of it. And at the time, I thought it was completely bonkers. And looking back on it now, I still find it completely bonkers. Um, whereas over here, you've got that instability in both the major parties like Australia had. And regardless of who is in government, you're going to have that instability. And the UK underneath, you've got this thing, it's an American term that is brought over here, um, but there is some truth in it. Um, you've got this problem with the blob. Australia doesn't have a blob. Um, a Define blob, blob you know, for my listeners. As in, you've just got lots and lots of people in the civil service um, and in the quangocracy, and you've also got this weird phenomenon of the government providing funding to charities that, that they then use that money to lobby the government. This is completely mad. You have to, you should, you need to stop this. It's just mad. It's a stupid thing. I mean, half the reason Stonewall is, is behaves as it does is because it gets state money. You know, you should, none of these charities should be begin, given money by the government. You know, the whole point of a charity is that so that ordinary members of the public can put their hand in their pocket and give their money to the charity to do what the charitable thing that they like. And if there are people out there who want to put their hand in their pocket and give it to Stonewall or give it to the LGB Alliance, who then, of course, those two are opposed, then that's great. But neither of them should be getting any money from the government. Um, you know, this is completely mad and that, that's what produces it. And all of these people, they, they transform everything into process and they don't care about outcomes. And it's just snouts in the trough for all of them. And you don't actually have to produce anything and they don't actually do very much. They're not any good for anything. And it, it, it's just pervasive all through the civil service. And the other thing I've noticed, and I noticed a bit of this even when I was at Oxford, um, you don't make a maths subject compulsory all the way through to the final year of high school. Now, 
you can't go to a good university in Australia unless you have a maths pass and you need a pretty good one too because those universities are, are quite hard to get into um, to the equivalent of A-level. And one of the things I noticed during the COVID pandemic was all your journalists who've all obviously stopped their maths at GCSE, they're just enumerate. I mean, you can't get away with that. Didn't Australia. understand the graph. They, they can't read a graph and, and they couldn't ask intelligent questions. I mean, I have watched multiple press conferences with people from the Canberra Press Gallery across the political spectrum, left wing, right wing, up wing, doesn't really matter because the, Australia, like here, has different newspapers and, and media outlets and, and so on, representing different strands of politics. The idiot COVID questions that you saw from places that should know better, like the BBC. Scott Morrison didn't get a single one during the entire pandemic like that from the press gallery in Canberra. And that's how the blob gets away with a lot of the things that it does, is because you've got all these people who can't do sums, um, and all these people in government who can't do sums, and then when you do get a couple of individuals, and the, the, the two who stood out in the Conservative leadership were actually Kemi Badenoch and Rishi Sunak, who, and although they disagreed with each other, it's very clear they can do sums, both of them. And the thing is, Sunak used to work in finance and, and Badenoch was an engineer. So, of course, they, they did do their maths at A-levels, obviously. And it, it, it shows in the way they argue. And that's why Sunak has made the argument about, I'm sorry, I'm not going to make uncosted promises, so therefore I will stick taxes up. You could disagree with him about that and argue that, you know, the problem is you're going to kill, make the economic recovery from COVID stillborn, which is the Truss's argument. But the point is he does actually have a serious mathematical and financial point when he, he argues that. Now, you can hear me talking like an Aussie, because this is the way Australian journalists and Australian commentators will talk about issues. People just don't do that here. And so now you've got this instability at the top of government. You've got relatively few people who are numerate. There are more in the Tories than there are in Labour, but there are still not enough. Um, you've got lots of people in the civil service and the quangocracy, people who haven't done any maths since they were 15. And this is not good for the country. And so this, to me, is at the root of my concern about you've got instability, ideological, serious ideological conflict, particularly in Labour. Um, and then you get the blue on blue, we want power yeah, with the yeah. Tories pulling great tufts of fur out of each other. Um, and poor governance underneath it. So, yes, this does worry me. I don't know where it's going to lead or what's going to happen. But I think there and a lot of other countries have it as well. I mean, you can just see a lot of the European leaders. I mean, look at Merkel with her energy policy. Talk about completely destroyed legacy, utterly destroyed legacy there with the Gone. war in Ukraine. And yes, yeah, just in six months. Yeah. Yeah. In six months, the entire legacy has just been burnt to the ground. Well, and I was I so was reading quite... today about um, about Gerhard Schroeder as well. I mean, he is he is an utter pariah in German politics now. It's been completely, uh, you, you know, burnt. his entire legacy, even more than Merkel's, has been burnt yes. to the ground. Yeah. But I mean, he is actually a tool of Gazprom and Nord Stream. You know, it's just awful, but extraordinary yeah. behaviour. Yeah. Uh, so yes, you're in trouble. This is a serious problem, and I live here. I chose to live here, so I work in the British press. Well, it's British media it's not, now. It's, uh, it's not too late to go back. <laughs> I mean, it's, not that I, I want mean, you to. In certain respects, it is easier for me to live here because of the British family. This is the thing that produces this loyalty to Britain. And Tony Abbott had it. He was born here. But a, a more famous, in, the, in an international sense example of it, was Australia's greatest writer and only Nobel Prize winner for literature, Patrick White, was born in the UK and was a dual national just like me and just like Tony Abbott. This is a very common phenomenon. <laughs> Helen, that's been a very colourful, wide-ranging conversation. Thank you. That was great. Um, I really enjoyed that. Okay, cheers. Um, is there, before you go, where can people find your work? Um, well, I'm a senior writer for Law and Liberty, which is a magazine run by Liberty Fund, which is one of these ridiculously wealthy and endowed American think tanks. I mean, I made a decision that I would 
not write for a newspaper. If I was offered a staff job, I would not write for a newspaper that might go bust. I mean, there were sort of various attempts to recruit me, and when Liberty Fund came along, I said yes to them because, I mean, they they have what's called what a friend of mine calls fuck off money. Um, <laughs> so I'm seeing you write for them, and I do a feature for them, one or two features for them every month. Um, I write for various other outlets, once again, mainly tied to the world of think tanks. So CAPEX is Centre for Policy Studies. My One of my novels was launched at the Adam Smith Institute. I mean, I'm broadly speaking on that sort of centre right, sort of the Liz Truss wing of the Tory party, basically. Um, although I, re I recognise that liberal Tories like me and like Liz Truss, you know, if, if, you, if you haven't got the sort of background like Malcolm Turnbull had as a barrister and a you you do finish up look, coming across as wonkish, you know, the person who's had a personality bypass, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, quote statistics at people all day, but not be very interesting. Um, so you can find all my work at Law and Liberty, and there's an author archive there. You can find all my work at CAPEX, Centre for Policy Studies, there's an archive there. Um, I write a lot, and I covered Brexit in a great deal of detail I, for a period there. I had to, like, write every week on, on this issue. I covered Brexit for The Australian as well, which is the country's main national daily that was basically reporting back to Australia what was happening in Britain. I've also written at various times for The Spectator, uh, for The Telegraph, you know, the usual kind of sort of right-leaning media. But because of the, the tradition I come from, which is that in Britain is that liberal Toryism and in Australia, the senator that I worked for, um, among other things, he was involved in cannabis legalisation, that kind of thing. I've also written for The Guardian and those kind of places, but it tends to be on the social issues like like drugs. And I have to admit, since 2016, there used to be a spot for kind of that liberal Tory in The Guardian and the, the left-leaning media, and that has become less and less and less, even when we agree that the silo effect, I call it, where the political tribes yeah. are just talking to themselves and not talking to each other at all, has just become greatly exaggerated and worse and worse every year in my experience. Ellen, thank you very much. So, yes, just you can find all that stuff there. It's all out there. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to The Hated and the Dead. If you've enjoyed this podcast, follow it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and, for good measure, leave us a review. You can also follow The Hated and the Dead on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, so you never miss new content.